Brian Dirk, this is the third night of our Winter History Series. Tonight, uh, Brian, Brian Dirk is an Associate Professor of History at Anderson University in Anderson, Indiana. This is his second time at Hildeen. Um, he was here in 1905 um, lecturing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's when the family moved in, 100 years, uh, um, 2005. <laughs> And you look remarkably young. Yeah, you look, yeah. Um, okay. He spoke in 2005 based on his book, Lincoln and Davis, Imagining America, 1809 to 1860. This evening, he will speak on Lincoln the Lawyer. Mr. Dirk is the author of numerous other books on Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. He was awarded the Barondess Lincoln Award of the Civil War Roundtable of New York in 2007. Um, on April 23rd, we'll have the last of, in this series for the winner. We'll have Mike, Michael Burlingame speaking on Lincoln, a study in character. Is that correct, Wayne? Yes. A study in character. That's at 7 o'clock here in the Welcome Center, uh, again, in the Beckwith Room. Now, Professor Dirk, thank you for being here. I'm a college professor, and I earn my living trying to keep rooms filled with teenagers awake, and I usually found that loud is good, so um, normally people can hear me fine, so I'm good. Okay, um, thanks for the introduction. I'm feeling pretty spry for 138 or whatever. <laughs> there you go. Um, boy, this is, it's nice to be back in, in Vermont, actually. Um, really enjoyed the drive through the state today. Um, these, are, these are heady days to be a Lincoln specialist, believe me. Um, I've been um, extremely busy. I, I talked to my wife on the phone a while ago, and she's kind of lost track of where I've been over the last month or so, just so many different places. Poor Julia. I Bless her heart. She, she married me. We, we, we married two years ago, and um, I don't really think she knew what she was getting herself into when she married a Lincoln scholar, you know, because right, right before we got married, um, I went to Springfield, um, in Illinois, to, to do, do a book talk on this book that was just coming out, and she came with me, and, and she's, a, she's a fifth grade elementary school teacher, so she's not quite familiar with, you know, what I was doing, and we, we pulled up to the back of the... Um, the Lincoln Library and Museum, and this car pulls up right next to us, and out of the car gets two Lincoln impersonators. <laughs> Stovepipe hat, beard, mole, the whole thing. Julie's just kind of going like that. You know, I'm like, I'm like honey, just, just welcome to my world, deal with it, you know. So we, 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 get, we get out of the car, and there's like, there's like, I mean, there's like people packed everywhere. I mean, the whole town was filled with people, and we saw like a CNN truck, and we saw like a, like a helicopter floating around like that, and, and Julie's like, well, I'm impressed with my fiance. This is pretty cool. You know, I'm like, well, what is this? Turns out Barack Obama was announcing his candidacy the very same day I was there. You know? I was like, yeah, honey, that chopper follows me around everywhere. You know, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know. So it's, um, it's been an interesting ride so far in, in, in many ways. Um, I thought tonight I would just sort of talk about um, what, what I wrote about in my book and just give you a general sense of... Um, what sort of lawyer Abraham Lincoln was, and then leave enough time, I hope, for plenty of conversation about this, because it's a very interesting topic. You know, when I, I first started doing this, you know, I, I taught people, I'd say, you know, I'm going to do a book on Lincoln's law as a lawyer, you know, and they sometimes would just react like, so what, you know? I mean, they're all lawyers. I mean, have we ever had a president who wasn't a lawyer? It's, it's amazing, and, and it's true. I mean, well over half of our chief executives have been attorneys, as a matter of fact, I, I think I counted up like 12 of Lincoln's 15 predecessors had been lawyers. So it was even more common back then than it is now. But, you know, there are lawyers and there are lawyers, you know. Um, a lot of the men who served in the White House who were lawyers only did the law long enough to move on to politics and really didn't see the law as their primary way of earning a living or their primary career. I mean, for example, people tend to forget that Franklin Roosevelt was a lawyer. He hated it. He got out as soon as he possibly could, but he was a lawyer. And, and you, you've got quite a few men like that who served in, in the White House in that way. Abraham Lincoln's different, though. Lincoln is by far the most experienced trial attorney we ever put in the White House. He spent 25 years at the Illinois Bar. And, and, and this was all he did. I mean, this, this, other than his political career, which if you know anything about Lincoln's political career, was very up and down. It was not a study gig for him at all. He didn't really have any other source of study income other than the law. This was his bread and butter. This was his day in and day out thing that he did. In fact, you know, I, I added up one time, and if you count the number of days 
that Abraham Lincoln spent as a nationally elected politician, he was a one-term congressman in the White House, um, it, it adds up to about 10% of his life. If you add up the number of days he spent as an active member of the Illinois Bar, it's about 40% of his life. Now, of course, that little 10%, he did a lot more momentous things, but still, if you look at the whole you know, body of work of his life, his law practice was a very large piece of that. Now, if you pick up a biography of Abraham Lincoln, chances are you're not going to read a whole lot about his law practice. I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I think, for one, people just don't like to be reminded that the man who many consider to be the greatest American president was a lawyer. But let's face it, we are very ambivalent about the, law, the legal profession. We have a, kind of a love-hate thing going on there. And if you look at a lot of the early biographies, especially, it's kind of, well, he's a lawyer. Then we go on to the, the, the other stuff because we don't want to talk about the fact that he did that for a living, you know, because it has a, it has a, um, it has a, 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 a difficult connotation for, for many Americans. So there's that. Um, there's, there's also the fact that we really didn't have documentation. If you go back to biographies written really before 2000, they don't have a lot to work with with the law practice. The, the, the basic source for the Lincoln biographers is the, uh, the uh, collected works of Abraham Lincoln, the nine volume set of his papers and speeches. If you go through that, you can find maybe, I don't know, 100 documents that relate to his law practice, which really isn't a whole lot, and a handful of cases um, that most biographers have known about. And in several cases, the biographers who wrote about Lincoln said, look, I do more with this, but I just don't know anything about it, and we just don't have the documentation. But all that changed here a few years ago. In 1990, the state of Illinois, which if you've ever been to Illinois, they love their Lincoln. I mean, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a Lincoln statue in Illinois. It's just amazing how many Lincoln things are there. The state of Illinois spent the money to go hire volunteers and paid assistants and editors to go into every courthouse in Illinois where he could have possibly practiced the law and go through every basement, dusty closet, archive holding, you name it, and just systematically spent a decade, 10 years, culling out every single scrap of paper related to the Abraham Lincoln law practice. It, it took them until the year 2000. And then, in the year 2000, when they were finished, bless their hearts, they didn't just throw all this stuff into an archive someplace. They used the new technology that's available to us now and put these things on a DVD-ROM database. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It is. I mean, it's, it's like an historian's Nintendo game or something. You know? when, when I first got this thing, I'd go buttonhole my students and say, check this out, man, I found a Lincoln larceny case. And they're like, Dr. Dirk, you got to get out more often, man. This is not pretty. You know? but, but, I mean, I mean it, it, is, it, is really, it really is an amazing thing. Okay? They found 90,000 new documents relate, yeah, whoa, to, related to the Lincoln law practice. And we went from knowing about 50 or so cases he litigated to well over 5,000. And these are all brand new sources of information. So we now have the data to actually do systematic, authoritative, and reliable analysis of just what sort of lawyer he was. All right, well, let's start at the beginning here. How, why did he become a lawyer? We don't know. He never really said. I suggest in my book, I, I think it, it, it was a way to get him off the farm. Lincoln did not like to farm. You know, he had that image of the rail splitter. The truth is he hated doing that kind of work. He wanted to move on to something bigger and better. He um, was incredibly ambitious. His law partner, Billy Herndon, later said, quote, that Lincoln's ambition was a little engine that knew no rest. And the law was a stepping stone to money and um, hopefully to a political career and that kind of thing. So I, I think it's actually a fairly prosaic answer. He wanted a better job, bottom line. Now, to go to law, to go get into the bar back then, you did not go to law school. There were almost no law schools in America in um, the 1820s, 1830s, the time he's, he's contemplating this. What you did was, you found a lawyer who would give you or loan you the books that you needed to read to pass the state bar exam. Yeah, it depended on what kind of arrangements you could work out with somebody. Usually what you did was you traded your labor for their books. A lot of young men would go and they would clerk in, um, 
some lawyer's office, and then they would uh, trade off the expertise to go get into the bar themselves. Lincoln didn't do this, though. He was actually un unusual this way. He met a man named John Todd Stewart, who uh, was, by the way, Mary Todd's uh, cousin, um, during the Black Hawk War, when Lincoln served in the Illinois State Militia. And Stewart kind of thought he had the makings of a lawyer, and Stewart just loaned him the books. Now, we're not talking about a library full of books here. As a matter of fact, you really only needed to read one book, Sir William Blackstone's Commentaries on the English Law. Now, you might wonder why English law. Well, our system was so close to the English system back then that if you mastered the English system, you pretty much mastered the American system as well. So Lincoln borrowed a copy of Blackstone and spent the next four years mastering that, at least that one book. Believe me, I've read it myself. It would take four years. It is extremely difficult. It's a multi-volume work very dry, very dense, very, very difficult. It's a testimony to Lincoln's character that he stuck with this for so long. Now, he may have read a couple of other things. We're not really sure about that, but we do know he read Blackstone. Now, when the time came for him to go test for the bar, real simple back then. They did not have written bar exams. No state had a written bar exam until Massachusetts did in 1855, so there's no written test. Basically, what you did was you went to the local judge, the judge usually had another lawyer in town who got appointed the examiner for that particular area, and you'd go to that lawyer, and that lawyer would uh, ask you a few questions, and if you sound like a lawyer, he'd give you a license. That's a sweet deal, isn't it? You know, if anybody's been to law school, they don't do that anymore. It's a lot more complicated. You know, to give you an idea of how laid back this was, Lincoln later on served as a bar examiner himself. And the story goes this young man went to find the local judge in the county he was in. It was Tazewell County, and it was when Lincoln was on the circuit. And he went to the judge and said, I want to be a lawyer. And they said, well, uh, Lincoln's the examiner this time. Go find him. And the guy went to the hotel room where he knew Lincoln was at, goes and knocks on the door. Lincoln opens the door, and, he's in, and Lincoln's shaving, okay? So Lincoln sits this kid down on the end of his bed, and while Lincoln finishes shaving, he asks him a few questions. When he gets done, Lincoln writes out a note to the judge. Give this young man a law license. He's a good deal smarter than he looks. A Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not talking about the paper chase here, guys. Okay, this was not a complicated deal. We don't know what kind of test Lincoln took. There's no record of that. Uh, probably something along the lines of a very informal set of questions by a local judge. He has entered um, into the docket book of the Sangamon County Courthouse, 1836, as, quote, a man of good moral standing, which is how you became a lawyer. Now you're a lawyer. Now, you know, you solve your problems, though. They're pretty much just started. Okay, now you've got to become a practicing lawyer and find a practice. Lincoln was fortunate, however, in that his mentor, John Stewart, the man who loaned him the books, had just happened to dissolve his partnership with another lawyer and was looking for a partner. He takes Lincoln on. This was a mixed blessing because John Todd Stewart was very politically ambitious, and right after Lincoln becomes this brand new partner in this two man law firm, um, the senior partner goes to Congress, leaves for Washington, D.C., and leaves Abraham Lincoln there to run the whole show himself. This is not Lincoln at his best, all right? He really didn't know what he was doing. He made quite a few very, very bad mistakes. I saw one letter he wrote to this guy. I, I, you, I've only got, we've only got one letter. We don't have the other letter. But this guy apparently wrote to him looking for something, and, and Lincoln wrote back, and Lincoln said, um, I've been in the state of greatest excitement trying to find the paperwork that you um, seem to want. Um, we've misplaced it, and I'm sorry. If I'd known you had wanted it that badly, I would have looked harder. <laughs> well, there's a good career move, huh? You know? Another story goes that uh, while he was a lawyer at this time, he showed up at the courthouse, and he had been hired sight unseen by a client who took one look at him, and the client said, you know, the guy's pants stopped at his calves, all right? His shirt was too short, and I don't think he'd combed his hair in a week. I hired a new lawyer right there on the spot. Lincoln had a lot of problems here. He was sloppy. He didn't know what he was doing, and Stewart had kind of left him hanging out to dry. Still, Lincoln kind of muddled through. When Stewart came back from Congress, uh, he and Lincoln agreed to part ways. Very amicably, by the way. They were still good friends, uh, remained friends the rest of their lives. But they decided to go different directions. Lincoln now needed another law partner. He was then um, fortunate again in that a man named Stephen Logan, who had been a judge in the um, Eighth Judicial Circuit had decided he could make more money as a lawyer. Again, these were very different days. And he resigned his judgeship 
to go practice the law. Lincoln had, had tried his very first case before Stephen Logan. So Logan knew him well. Logan, by all accounts, was giving Lincoln a pretty good run for his money as the ugliest man at the Illinois bar. Everybody said his pictures don't do his ugliness justice. This guy, this big wild mane of white hair, they say he looked like a gnome. Okay, I think he kind of looks like Bilbo Baggins myself. That's my personal feeling on that. And he was also really a flake. He, would, he loved whittling while he heard cases. So he'd be whittling all this stuff while people were arguing, and the clerks would be holding gunny sacks under the bench to catch all the pine shavings. Okay? So Logan was a little bit of a flake, but he was widely considered to be the best legal mind in Illinois. Very bright, very sharp. He's also one of the unsung heroes of Abraham Lincoln's life because you can make a pretty good case that Logan kind of saved Lincoln. He um, taught him how to do basic paperwork. Lincoln was never very good at it, but he at least got passable at it. He taught Lincoln some rudimentary skills of research, that kind of cleaned him up a little bit. And Logan partnered with Lincoln for about, uh, I forget, like five years. At this point, Logan's son had become a lawyer. And Logan then, quite understandably, wanted to partner with his son. So he and Lincoln parted ways, again, very amicably, very friendly. At this point, Lincoln's been a lawyer for over a decade now. He wants to be the senior partner. He's going to go do the choosing now because he's got to practice. He goes to a young man who had been reading law in the Logan and Lincoln Law Office, acting as a clerk, a guy by the name of William Herndon. Herndon would be his third and final partner. Herndon would be his partner, for, I forget, from 1844 till about the time, till time Lincoln left for the White House. Herndon, in many ways, was a very good fit with Lincoln. Billy Herndon was a good researcher. He knew how to find information. Lincoln was always kind of weak at that. Remember, he had no formal education. So he had a bit of a struggle finding precedents and sites, that kind of thing. Billy could do that and do it quite well. On the other hand, Billy wasn't very good in front of a jury. That was Lincoln's strong suit. I mean, they really meshed quite well. Herndon was also gregarious. He was a blowhard. He had an opinion about everything that he shared with everybody. He made people mad all the time. He was an alcoholic. Billy was a drunkard. Uh, Lincoln uh, bailed him out on more than one occasion from the local hoose gal after he'd gone on a spree. So Billy could be a project, okay? But Billy, in many ways, was a very good partner. Now, Lincoln and Herndon had several law offices around the Springfield Town Square. They had like three or four off and on over the years. Lincoln's law office, you know, most lawyers back then were considered to be kind of on the seedy side. But even other lawyers were taken aback at the Lincoln and Herndon Law Office of how awful it was. Okay? And so when you walked into this room, okay, and so you'd open the door, and you couldn't see anything. There's no light let in, okay, because the windows hadn't been cleaned since who knows when. Probably the building put up. So there's no light coming to the windows. You didn't want to open the windows, though, because they'd open right over a roof of a stable. Don't want that smell wafting up into the office. So it's very dank, very dusty. In the middle of the room, they said it would be, they had like two oblong tables covered in green baize. The reason the green baize was there to cover all the knife marks and stuff that had been cut into the tables over the years, okay? And then they were in a T-shape in the middle, and there was all this paperwork piled up all over the place, including a big overstuffed envelope that had all these papers crammed in it and a note on top in Lincoln's handwriting that said, if you can't find it anywhere else, look in this. <laughs> that was his filing system. Oh, by the way, you know why he wore the stovepipe hat? That's where he kept his papers. He crammed his law papers in the hat every morning and then pulled it on his head to go down the street. The kids in the neighborhood knew this, and they would sometimes, for a joke, run a string across the top of a tree on the way to the law office and knock his hat off and knock his papers down the street. You know, he'd get a big kick out of that, you know? I mean, and it said the, 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 the office was just unbelievably dirty. This one kid who had read for the law in there had said, Lincoln one time got paid by a poor client in a bag of bean seeds, okay? And I guess he just sort of threw the seeds in a corner, and the, and, the, and the bag had broken open, and the seeds had spilled out, and there was so much dirt in the corner that plants were growing out of the floor. Really, on the one side here. It also didn't help that Lincoln on occasion brought his young children into the law office. If you know anything about Lincoln, he was a um, ridiculously indulgent father. And um, he would let his children basically run amok, knocking over ink stands, throwing papers everywhere. Billy later groused to a friend, had they crapped in Lincoln's boots, he would have laughed and thought it quite smart. And he didn't use the word crap, by the way. Billy got very upset about this. 
They were like some kind of funky old married couple, you know. It was just weird. Billy would come in, and they had one beat-up sofa on one side, but it was too short for Lincoln. Everything's too short for Lincoln, okay? And he'd walk in, and Lincoln's legs would be dangling over the side of the thing there because he couldn't fit in the thing, reading a paper. And, um, you know, they'd go off in some big conversation about something, you know. And it was just, it was just a very informal thing, you know. Now, the law office, though, wasn't where Lincoln spent a lot of his time. Back then, guys, you couldn't. You couldn't really afford to spend all of your time in your office. You wouldn't get enough business. It was different days back then, you know. There wasn't that much litigation. So you had to go out and get the litigation. So what you had to do, and what most lawyers did, was called riding the circuit. See, back then, the state of Illinois did not want to pay to put a judge in every county seat in Illinois. It cost too much. What they did was they would have a, a circuit. In, in Lincoln's case, it's the 8th Judicial Circuit, which was like a strip of counties across the middle part of the state. And twice a year, the local judge would saddle up his buggy, and Lincoln and about a half a dozen other lawyers would saddle up their horses, and they would ride around, it's called riding the circuit, you'd ride to the county seats. And all the farmers in those counties all knew when, quote, court day was. And then the, the judge would show up, the lawyers would show up, they'd go get a hotel room, or usually a tavern, or something like that, and then, you know, the farmers would come up and they'd go over to, uh, they'd go over to Lincoln maybe and say, uh, I hear you're a lawyer, uh, my name's Bob, my, my neighbor Jim over there stole my hog, I want it back. Okay, so you, you start the lawsuit going. You get the idea what kind of case we're talking about here, okay? And they would litigate these little nickel and dime cases and then go on from circuit to circuit all the way around. Most lawyers hated that circuit. The Eighth Judicial Circuit was called the Mud Circuit, and that's not an endearing term, all right? It was a very nasty place to be. The food was bad. The accommodations were worse. Most lawyers didn't do this one day longer than they had to. Most of them would only ride part of the term, and then they'd go back home where they had a nice, comfortable bed, and their wives waiting for them. Abraham Lincoln was the only lawyer that anybody knew of who rode the circuit every single day. It was available. He never complained. He loved every minute of it. And everybody said he really dug riding the circuit. Rumor had it that the reason this was so was that he didn't get along with Mary very well. Now, I don't personally buy that, although I do think they had marital problems. I, I think Lincoln just really enjoyed the kind of easy male company of the circuit. He was the kind of man who liked to hang out with the boys. Okay, and what better place than the circuit where he could tell his jokes and stories and everybody would laugh. You know, he wasn't just avoiding Mary, he was avoiding Billy Herndon too. Billy usually stayed home, you know, so that's what Lincoln did. Now, the circuit was very important to him though. I mean, guys, think about it. This is where he would have met most people that he knew. Because this is where he spent most of his time. So he, for one thing, he meets very important political contacts. The judge in the 8th Judicial Circuit was a man named David Davis. David Davis was a great, big, hulking bear of a man. He weighed over 300 pounds, and that was extremely rare back then. He was huge. It took a four-horse buggy to haul him around. All right, no kidding. I mean, we never would have made it through the mud circuit without that thing, all right? And, and he was um, very much a close friend of Lincoln's. As a matter of fact, one story I ran across was there was a lawyer looking for Lincoln on the circuit, and he went to this hotel room where he and Davis were sharing a room, opened the door, and Lincoln and Davis were engaged in this vicious pillow fight. Feathers flying everywhere, you know. And, they said, and Lincoln was beating the crap out of the judge over there. And, and Davis was leaning on the bed, quote, puffing like a lizard because he was so fat he couldn't swing back. You know, they're all laughing so they could hardly stop, you know. So very good friend. The reason Davis matters here, though, is that David Davis in 1860 would be Lincoln's campaign manager. It was David Davis that got Lincoln the nomination in Chicago for the Republican National Convention, and then Lincoln rewarded Davis by putting him on the U.S. Supreme Court during the Civil War. This is a very important contact. Other lawyers he met, Ward Hill Lamon, Leonard Sweat, I could run down a list of names. These are men who were, in one way or the other, very useful to him politically. But he also met ordinary people, you know? I mean, think about it. You go around to these courts, where everybody's at on a court day. It was, like, it, was like a, it was like a carnival for these farmers to go take a day off and go sue somebody, you know? And everybody enjoyed the show. And, you know, one, well, really, I mean, back then, the, 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 you know, going to court and watching somebody, you know, watching lawyers rip other lawyers and rip clients and get other, that was their version of ESPN, you know? Because I mean, they didn't have anything else. And, and, and this one guy, this reporter who went with Lincoln, when he was running for president, um, he, he kind of hung out with him a lot. He said, I went with Lincoln, and he said, the man knew everybody. He said, like, he knew everybody in the state, it seemed. Well, this is where he met them, you know, on the circuit. 
Now, what kind of cases did he practice? Well, guys, back then, lawyers didn't specialize. You couldn't do that. You couldn't have one narrow thing you did. Because, again, there's not enough business. Lincoln was a general practitioner <laughs> in the very broadest sense of the term. I mean, I went through those cases he, uh, that he litigated, over 5,000 of them. It would be hard to find a type of court case he didn't litigate. I mean, he did everything. Probate, partnership settlement, uh, you know, larceny, slander. Oh, the slander cases are fun. They're a blast. You think your great, great, great grandparents didn't know how to insult each other? Oh, they're good. They're very good at it. And then they took, took, took exception and got mad. I mean, they're, they're, they're interesting to read. They really are. He didn't do much criminal law. I was a little surprised by that, you know, because if you ever watch any of the old movies about Lincoln, anybody ever seen Young Mr. Lincoln with Henry Fonda way back in the day in the 30s and all that? They have, they have him doing a murder trial, you know, and, and every time you think of Lincoln, you think of, you know, that kind of thing. If you talk about percentages, however, only a tiny number of his court cases were criminal cases. About, you know, I'd, I'd say, and we, guys, we have to have rough numbers here because even after the uh, Lincoln Legal Papers Project was done, they themselves admit they couldn't find everything. There were some courthouse fires that burned some records and things like that. So I, if I'm estimating, it's because we just really don't know the whole numbers. But his criminal practice, roughly 10%, you know. Now, there was one thing he did more than anything else. It's not really a specialty, but it's kind of where he got most of his daily legal life. Over half of those 5,000 cases that we know of involve debt collection. Insofar as Abraham Lincoln had a specialty, it was a debt collector. Now, you probably kind of go, well, that sounds thrilling. Well, it really isn't, okay, but that's what he did. I mean, think about it, guys. Back, back then, Illinois is on the frontier. Not a lot of money out there. There's not a lot of cash floating around. These are, these are cash poor people. If you're going to try and start a business, which a lot of these people wanted to do, then you had to do it on credit. And, the, and, these, and these slips of paper, these IOUs, these promissory notes between people was like a primitive form of currency on the Illinois frontier. And they would change hands four or five times. Well, eventually somebody's going to want to get paid. And maybe you can't figure out who's supposed to pay you or where they're at. Or maybe they can't pay you. You don't have collection agencies back then. They don't exist. There's no credit rating system at all. There are no skip tracers. There's none of the stuff that we are used to when it comes to, like, you know, credit and debt relationships. All you've got is a lawyer to go get the, the guy who owes you money and track them down and get your money back for you. Now, Abraham Lincoln represented the creditor well over 75% of the time, far more creditors than debtors. And some people would look at that and say, well, that means he sympathized with the, the creditor end of things. That's way too simplistic, guys. I mean, if you break it down, and I, I did, boy, it took a little while, but you break down all these clients, a lot of these clients were creditors and debtors off and on all the time. I mean, they'd go back and forth and back and forth and all that sort of thing. So there really isn't a creditor class and a debtor class. They're all mixed up together. Lincoln would represent one guy, there's one guy named James Reed, who was a regular Lincoln client who went to Lincoln for, I believe it was 12 different cases. Sometimes as a creditor, sometimes as a debtor. Reed's interesting, by the way, because in 1847, he, or 1846 rather, he decided that the business um, atmosphere in Illinois wasn't so good, and he wasn't doing as well as he thought he would. And his wife had these bad, sick migraine headaches that he thought would get better if they moved out west. So James Reed decided to hook up with a local family in Springfield called the Donners. Oh, yeah, those Donners, yeah, yeah. In other, in other words, as bad as business was in Illinois, things could get worse, and they did, okay? So, yeah, Lincoln actually represented a member of the Donner Party before he went out and got into that whole thing, all right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, guys, ask afterwards. It's kind of gruesome. I won't go on down the road there. But anyway, um, Lincoln, Lincoln represented the creditors, I think, though, more often because simply they're the ones that hung around. You know, they're, they're more likely to go get a lawyer, you know, because if you're a debtor back then, you can, you can, you can get out of Dodge, and probably get away with it. As a matter of fact, if you went up to the front door of a farmhouse in like Illinois, and you're going to go foreclose on the farm or whatever, and the sheriff goes up and knocks on the door, if he sees the letters GTT carved in the door, you know what that stood for? Gone to Texas. And buddy, you ain't ever going to see your money again. I mean, it's just a whole different life back then. So a lot of these debtors would just take off. You know, which meant that the creditors were the only ones around. That's why Lincoln gets most of his business from the creditors. Now, as things progressed, 
as he got older, as he got more well-established, Lincoln did suddenly less debt litigation and for bigger sums. If you go back, and again, guys, we, we, we have very little information about the specifics of these cases. The vast majority of the time, all you've got to work with are the names of the litigants, what the lawsuit was about, and who won, and that's it. So we have very little information on how he chose his clients, and we have very little information on how much money he made off these cases. I'd say probably out of those, out of those 5,000 cases, we know how much money he made on maybe 50 of them, which isn't a very good percentage. But we, I would guess that he probably made anywhere from $2 to $10 per case on the debt cases, depending on how much trouble he had to go through. That's not a lot of money. But if you got enough of them and packed them together, that's the foundation of his practice year in and year out. Those kinds of cases are like 60 to 70% of his total caseload. Now, as he gets closer to becoming president, mid-1850s, um, he starts to represent more well-heeled clients, in particular railroads. Uh, I've heard him described as a railroad lawyer in other places. I'm not sure I would exactly buy that, though. Uh, yes, he did represent the Illinois Central Railroad, uh, got the biggest retainer he ever got from the Illinois Central, $5,000, which is a ton of money back then. But he was just as likely to represent people suing the railroads. So it's not like he was a railroad shill. He wasn't their corporate guy. He, would, he was a general practitioner lawyer. If a railroad came his way, he was totally cool with that. All right? But he would just as soon represent a guy who's suing the railroads or getting in the way of the railroads. That, that, that's just the way, the way the law practice worked back then. Now, what kind of lawyer was he exactly? Hard to get at. Because here's the problem. He became really famous after the war, you know? And, you know, all of these old lawyers who used to practice law with him, they wanted a piece of the Lincoln pie, too, man. I mean, you know, after he's shot, I mean, he becomes an American hero, and everybody writes a book about Abraham Lincoln and his law buddies to liven up a bar association dinner or whatever, tell these grand stories about Lincoln. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger, you know? And then they say, by God, I knew back in 1839 he was going to be a great man. Uh-huh, sure, yeah, I'm sure that's true. You know, who, who knows that's true? And there's all these fantastic legends that cropped up about Lincoln. There was a legend, for example, that Abraham Lincoln never represented a guilty client. I mean, come on, guys. He's honest, Abe, you know? And there's this whole thing of... He's just, there, there, was, there, there, are, there are these literally these stories that say he was just so darn honest that he couldn't deal with dishonest clients, you know. There's one legend, for example, that he was involved in one of his rare murder trials when he was, he was with him. There were two lawyers, him and Leonard Sweat, were both representing the defendant. And the, the legend has it that in the middle of the trial, Lincoln f suddenly figures out that he's got a guilty man in his hands. And according to the legend, he stands up in the middle of the courtroom, turns to his partner, Leonard Sweat, and says, you defend this man, Sweat. I can't do it, and walks out. That would have probably got him in a lot of trouble. They didn't disbar many lawyers back then, but that would have been right up there with a, a really serious breach of ethics, you know? Another legend has it that he stood up in front of the, the Illinois Supreme Court. He did have some appellate work. He even had a few cases before the Supreme Court, uh, U.S. Supreme Court. There's not very many, but, but he was in front of the Illinois Supreme Court. Legend has it he stood up in front of the judges and said, Your Honors, I can't find a single case here that backs my side. But I found a bunch that backs the other side. But I'm so darn honest and good, I'll just give you this book and let you guys figure it out. <laughs> yeah, right. And Santa Claus reads every letter. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you're going to believe that, then, I mean, come on. Let's, let's, be, let's, be, let's be honest about this, okay? Lincoln was an honest lawyer. I very much believe that. In the sense that he did... Nothing that would be considered unethical or improper within the bounds of his profession. And the reason I say that is, first of all, there's no evidence of it. And second of all, you know, he lived in a political climate that was every bit as vicious as ours. And over the years, he was accused of everything. He was accused of being everything from a, from a horse thief to an adulterer. But no political opponent ever accused him of being a shyster or an ambulance chaser or an unethical lawyer. And I figure if there's any kind of smoke or fire there, it would have come up in one of these campaigns he was involved in. But there's, I mean, he was an ethical attorney. But he represented lawyers, I mean, he represented clients as, as they came, you know. Um, it, it's, it, guys, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell who he would have turned down 
you know, because there's no record of that. We have no, nobody wrote down who he turned away. So, you know, it may be that there were clients who came to him who were just so unsavory. He said, I don't have to do with you. Get out of here. He may have done that. But if you look at the clients he had over the years, man, he had some pretty bad people as well as some pretty good people. It was all spread out. Was he successful? Well, he probably won more cases than he lost, but that's hard to measure, too. I mean, think about it. If he represents, let's say, for example, he represents a client in a slander suit. Let's say the client wants $5,000 in damages from some guy because the guy called him a numbskull or whatever. And then they go to trial, and maybe the jury only awards uh, $500. Well, is that a win or a loss? I mean, on the one hand, the client might have not expected to get anything, and Lincoln aimed high trying to get something, and that would be a victory. On the other hand, the client might have really thought he deserved five grand and be really mad at Lincoln because he couldn't get his five, that kind of money. It's, it's hard to say from that perspective what winning and losing is. I do think he won more cases than he lost, and he was a successful lawyer because he had a lot of repeat business. If you go look at the lists of clients, you got people coming back to him five, ten, dozen, twenty times. I figure they've got to be happy with the job he's doing. If they're not going to do that. You know, so he's a, he's a successful lawyer. He's a good lawyer. He's not a great lawyer. He didn't do anything innovative here. I mean, if you look at what he did, he's not, he's, not, he's not creating new legal doctrine. I read one early biographer who claimed he was the greatest legal mind in America since John Marshall. No, no, no. He was a workman. That's what he did. This is what he did to earn a living. There's nothing original here that I can see. Solid attorney, but that's about it. Now, why would this matter to the president? What did this matter? Well, it, you can see echoes of the law practice in his presidency. He was, for example, very, very sensitive to the legal aspects of his policies when he went into the White House. Very sensitive. That's why he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation the way he did. Uh, if you look at what he said about some of the more controversial measures passed by Congress during the war, like the Confiscation Act, he went over them with a lawyer's eye. It even descended down to his role as um, pardoning soldiers for deserting while on duty. It's interesting stuff. He would insist on personally going over every document available from courts martial for soldiers being accused of being shot for desertion and throw them out when he ever had the, the excuse to do so using his legal training about evidence and that kind of thing. So you can see little echoes there of his, of his, of his law practice and how it affected him. But there are more subtle ways that his law practice affected how he became president as well and what he did. During the war, everybody said that Abraham Lincoln could work with anybody. I mean, it really is amazing. When you really look at the sources, people say, yeah, you know, the guy can, the guy can work with anyone, you know? And they, and they chalk it up to him being nice. He's a nice guy. You know, he's very laid back. He's very unselfish. One of his favorite sayings, according to his private secretary, John Hay, was, quote, in politics, there should be short statutes of limitations, you know, that kind of thing. I think that one of the reasons why he could work with anybody was because, you know, as a lawyer, Think about all the bad behavior he saw, day in and day out. I mean, he saw people at their worst, right? I mean, he had you know, divorce cases. That's not pretty, you know? Um, but partners dissolving their businesses. Creditors, you know, tracking out debtors. Debtors running away from creditors. You know, and then criminal law, you know, whatever he did, he saw that too. He saw about every form of bad behavior anybody could come up with over 25 years at the bar. And I think it taught him not to be overly judgmental, and not to take things personally. Because when you walked into the courtroom, guys, you couldn't afford to ask, is my client a good person? You know? You've got to represent him to the best of your ability and set your emotions at the front door. This is a basic legal training tool that they use even today in law schools. They, they tell lawyers today, when you're going to go represent a client, get the emotions out of it. Think in terms of tactics. Guys, Lincoln did that day in and day out for 25 years. And I think that meant when he became president, he didn't take the slings and arrows personally. He didn't take the insults personally. He rarely got mad at anybody. And all he asked from his subordinates and his generals was results. Contrast that with Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president. Davis was a soldier. He was not a lawyer. Davis took everything personally. Davis couldn't get along with anybody. Because he was so emotionally involved in every decision he made, Davis couldn't handle criticism, and he couldn't deal with difficult generals. 
Lincoln could deal with George McClellan. My God, if anybody can do that, I mean, that's pretty impressive, you know. McClellan was a complete jerk in many, in many ways. And yet Lincoln could work with the man. So I think this is a skill he got from the law practice. Another skill, and guys, I don't want to sound cynical here, but he learned how to put on a show. Because think about it. Jury trials. He's got to go persuade a box full of 12 men, good and true, to vote his way. And he learned the subtleties of communication to people, day in and day out there. His big political speeches, they're important. But his bread and butter was going to these people. And he learned how to communicate in a simple, straightforward, unpretentious way. He once told his partner, Billy Herndon, he said, Billy, when you're giving a speech, don't aim too high. He said, the, the rich, intelligent people, they'll understand you. Aim low so the common man can follow what you're saying. And isn't that what we value in Abraham Lincoln's speeches? His simplicity, his economy of language, his straightforward putting of the idea out front in such simple, elegant language. I think he learned this at least in part in the courtroom. He learned other things as well. You know, I saw an eyewitness account by a guy who had seen Lincoln in, in a courtroom. And he wrote this, I'm not paraphrasing here, but this guy wrote down, he said, he said, God, that Lincoln's a slob. He said, he walked into the courtroom today, and he had mud in his boots, and his pants didn't quite fit, and his suspenders were all askew, and his hair didn't look like it was mopped. And he said, Lincoln looked to me like a rough farmer. And then when I looked at the court cases he was doing that day, you know who was in the jury box, guys? Twelve farmers. You know? And then I saw another account by another guy, who wrote down, again, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you know, I had heard Lincoln was a real slob. They came into court today, perfect suit, immaculately dressed, cravat, all straight and everything. He looked, he looked just perfectly good. You know who was in the jury box that day? Twelve rich guys, you know. That's not, a, that's not a coincidence. He understood. He understood that you have got to have the skill to, to, to put on a presentation as president. And again, I don't mean that cynically. God save us from presidents who can't do that. Or we're really in trouble if we elect a man to the White House, I think on occasion we have, who don't understand that you've got to, to a certain extent, understand that you're on, it's almost like a theater. You know, you, you've got to put on a show to, to give people the feeling you want them to give. I think Lincoln knew how to do that. He did it very, very effectively. And I think the law practice, in many ways, was the foundation. Now, I wanted to close with an anecdote that relates to Robert Lincoln being here at the Robert Lincoln home. The story goes that Robert Lincoln came to Lincoln in the White House uh, during the war and told his dad that he wanted to go into Harvard Law School. And Lincoln said to his son, well, if you go to Harvard, you're going to learn a lot more than I ever did, but you're not going to have half as much fun. <laughs> Thank you. Well, any questions you guys have? Here? Yes. Uh huh. Oh yeah, the Almanac trial. Yeah, I um, I we all spend a lot of time with that because it's so popular. The, the 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 case if you don't know about this, this is his most famous case. And what happened here was Lincoln was representing um, a young man named Duff Armstrong, who um, he had known from uh, from childhood. This was when Lincoln was a rich lawyer, 1857 or 1858. Um, Duff had been with two other friends going, they went to a camp revival meeting in uh, Beardstown, Illinois, and, you know, a camp revival, you know, the whole, yeah, yes, do you believe kind of thing going on, but then around the edge of it, they had all these saloons set up, like, I guess you gave your heart to Jesus and then celebrated or something, you know, and, um, he got real drunk and got in a fight with this one guy and the, and the guy got killed. And um, Duff was, was, was said to have gotten what's called a slung shot, which is this really vicious weapon. It was a, a, a canvas bag full of lead that he swung and hit this guy named Metzger square in the face and broke a bunch of bones in his face, and Metzger died two, three days later. And Duff was up for, um, for murder on this. Uh, Lincoln was reluctant to take the case, but he took it because Duff's mother was a widow, Hannah Armstrong, whom he had known when he was a young man in New Salem. And Lincoln took the case, and... The problem he had was there was an eyewitness who said, I saw Duff swing the slung shot and hit the guy in the face. So Lincoln goes to the trial, and he goes to the bailiff, and he hands the bailiff a book. And he says, now during the trial, if I motion for this, I want you to bring this to me. And the bailiff says, all right, fine, whatever. And then they get into the trial, and Lincoln gets this eyewitness up in the stand, and the eye he gets the eyewitness to say several times, I saw Duff do it. 
And then Lincoln said, well, how is that possible? It's the middle of the night. I can't see anything. And then witness said, no, nah, man, it's a full moon out. I can see like, like, like daylight out there. I can see everything. And that's when Lincoln motioned for the book. And the book was an almanac. And he picked up the book and held it up and said, but according to this almanac, there was no moon that night. And according to the eyewitnesses, the whole jury erupted into laughter and completely destroyed the uh, credibility of the witness. And then Lincoln gave a very heart-rending jury speech in which he said, you know, don't leave poor Hannah alone. She's a poor widow, that kind of thing, and, and got Duff off. Then not only that, the whole thing is pro bono. He didn't charge Hannah a dime for this. And then during the war, Hannah, who had some cheek, wrote him as president and asked her to get his, her son Duff out of the Union Army, and Lincoln discharged him and sent him home. So that, that's, that's the Almanac trial. The movie played a lot with the details on that, you know, and there, had, there was a rumor that Lincoln actually bamboozled people by bringing up a fake Almanac that was from a different year. <laughs> that's not true, guys. Uh, there, 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 it was a rumor, but uh, I've, I've, I've seen several, um, yeah, that would have been a pretty good one, wouldn't it? Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, they're really, that's my encyclopedia over there, whatever. But, you know, um, the truth is, from what we can tell, it was, it was the real deal. It was, it was really the Almanac that was... Good. Other questions, Bob? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's. That's a great question. Um, out of the five thousand cases, and I'm actually digging into this right now because I'm doing a new book on Lincoln and race. And I've looked at his law practice, and out of those 5,000 cases, uh, I forget how many, I think it's like 22 cases had to do with African Americans. Very tiny minority, first of all. Of those cases, you can't find a pattern here, okay? He represented, in several cases, men who had tried to hide fugitive slaves who had crossed the Ohio River, and, and that's a very noble thing. He tried to help these guys who were in trouble because they'd helped fugitive slaves get away. And he did have one case in which he, he helped get um, freedom for some African Americans under the Northwest Ordinance, arguing that they were freed because they made Indian soil. On the other hand, there's a famous case called the Matson case, in which he was hired by a slaveholder from Kentucky who had brought his slaves into Illinois, and um, the, the slaves sued for their freedom, saying once we got into Illinois, we're free. Lincoln represented the slaveholder, trying to get his slaves back, and he, and he did it zealously as any lawyer would. I argue in the book that, and guys, you can do what you want to with that, as far as your judgment of Lincoln's character, but my, my opinion is he's a lawyer. He's not really supposed to ask questions about that. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no doubt that Lincoln was anti-slavery. He hated slavery every day of his life, all right? I mean, there, there's no question about that. It's very well recorded. But as a lawyer, as long as the client had a case, and as long as it was a case that was legally defensible and would not involve him in any professional impropriety, he would take it. So you, there, there, that's a great question. There, there is no pattern that I can see in those cases where he's picking clients for their moral worth one side or the other. He took what came to his door. Bottom line. Good, good. Other other questions, Bob? Yeah. You really think that's gonna be an argument in the Ninth Circuit? <laughs> Probably for you. <laughs> if I offend you, I'm sorry, guys, whatever I said, I'm saying. <laughs> what is the concern? What is the more of a primary concern of the parties with respect to slavery? That's a really good what question. Oh, well, you know, I mean, guys, by the way, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I, I, maybe I should be. Um, I'm not, sometimes I wonder if this would have been an advantage to be a lawyer because, I mean, well, it's a different, it was a different practice back then technically, so there are things that didn't really translate. I think Lincoln teaches us that you, you, can, you can be a good professional attorney and be ethical and still represent your clients to the best of your abilities. I think he did both those things. He walked that line very well. There's a famous document that he wrote called Notes for a Law Lecture. And we have no idea what the purpose of this document was. It's just a thing they found in his files that are, it's the only thing, the only time he ever reflected on what it meant to be a lawyer. And he has this great paragraph that from what I understand at the turn of the century, lawyers used to hang this in their law offices in which he said, resolved to be an honest lawyer. And if you decide you cannot be an honest lawyer, then choose some other profession, the choosing of which you do not consent to be a knave. And I think that's a wonderful little saying, you know. Um, you guys, you, you've got to remember, Abraham Lincoln was in the, the professional bar at a time 
when there really wasn't the layers of professional regulation and professional organization that lawyers enjoy now. There was no ABA, for example. They don't come into play until after the Civil War. There are a few local bar associations, but they're more like gentlemen's drinking clubs than anything else. Um, it, you know, I, I was really curious. I never ran across a single case of a lawyer being disbarred. I think you could probably pretty much get away with much about anything. You know, I mean, it's very lax, very fast and loose. And yet, Lincoln, in a time when there would have been, I think, a lot of temptation, especially since he wasn't a rich man, to go sort of kick over the traces and grab, grab at money, not thinking about the ethical implications as a professional, chose not to do so. And I think that would be the lesson I would, I would take from that myself. Good. That's, yeah. It certainly did, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, during the Civil War, he was, this is the, the very first, first of all, habeas corpus, let me explain now, okay, that's, that's a little complicated. Habeas corpus is Latin terms meaning to have the body. And what habeas corpus is, if, if you're ever thrown in jail, your lawyer will go to a judge and sue for, uh, to show why you were arrested, um, and, and, then the, and then the government has to show why, it has to show why you got hauled into jail. It's called the writ of habeas corpus. It's still there, guys. It's still do today, you know. Um, it's, 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 it's like a fundamental right of individual liberty, okay? It means that the government can't just throw you in jail and not give a reason why, all right? Well, during the war, when the war first breaks out, Abraham Lincoln's in Washington, D.C. Now, look at the timeline here. He's, he's, he's um, inaugurated in March of 61. Congress is not going to meet again until July of 61. There's like, a, there's like a five-month span there where there's no Congress at all that he can go consult. He is in Washington, D.C., which is basically in Maryland, and Maryland is threatening to leave the Union. I mean, big time. There are reports coming into him every day of Confederate agents cutting telegraph wires, you know, mining bridges to be blown, training Confederate volunteers. There's a lot of secession sentiment in Maryland. Lincoln decides that if Maryland goes, the whole ball game is going to go. They're going to have to evacuate Washington, D.C., and they'll probably lose the war before they even get started. So then, they, so what people said, they came in and said, look, you've got to give us the tools to go arrest these people. All right? The, nor the ordinary tools of civil courts are not going to work. We need, we need to have you suspend the writ. Now, in the U.S. Constitution, that power is in the document. But it had never been used. I, I think it had been used maybe once during the War of 1812, and then very briefly. This is really the first time it's ever done. Lincoln, by his own authority, suspends the writ of habeas corpus for the state of Maryland um, without congressional approval, and it is used, and it is used robustly. The U.S. Army rounds up people they suspect of being secessionist sympathizers, throws them in jail, and basically tosses the key away. Now, it depends on your point of view here. You know, um, Lincoln gets blasted for this. He really does. On the other hand, first of all, the Constitution doesn't specifically say you've got to go ask Congress. It's a weird sentence in the document. It says, the, the, it's a passive voice sentence. It says, the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended except in times of national emergency. And Lincoln himself later said, nothing in the document says that I can't do this. Okay, because it doesn't say Congress has to approve this. And by the way, when Congress got back into session, they retroactively approved every single thing Lincoln did. All right? So Lincoln says, look, there's nothing that says I can't do this. Second of all, a scholar named Mark Neely, who wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book in 1992 called Fate of Liberty, went through all the arrest records of all these people, thousands of records. Mark did just superhuman work going through all the arrest records. And he said there were problems, there were excesses, there were times when the Army was overzealous and threw people in jail that didn't need to be there. But he said on the whole, the Army was careful. And on the whole, most of these people were doing exactly what the Army said they were doing. So again, you make your own mind up on that. I, 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 try to, I tell my students, I'm not going to push you in a particular direction here. The fact is, he did suspend the writ of habeas corpus. He did it without congressional approval, and he did it with a heavy hand, and, and arrested quite a few people, and there were some people that didn't need to be arrested. But Lincoln himself later said, he said, you know, shall I let all the laws but one go, go um, un, uh, unbroken and then have the union fall apart because that one law must be cherished? I think not. That's what, that's what he said. So there, there it is. Um, yeah. I want to know if you run across this stuff. Uh, could I get you to read uh, from the top here, d down? Oh, I know that part. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but this was um, an an anecdote. Um, yeah, this I've heard this before. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Lincoln was offered a fine law partnership in Chicago, but he refused it as he did not like city life. He never could bring himself to charge a large fee, and so he was always poor, but he did not care for wealth, which he said is simply a superfluity of the things we don't need. Well, there's a little bit of truth, a little bit not in there. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, he wore either a flat straw hat or a high fuzzy beaver. <laughs> he carried an old carpet bag and a faded green cotton umbrella marked inside with a white thread. A link in the knob had been lost. In the, yeah, that's all true. And that's, there's actually a physical description of him on the circuit with a beat up broken umbrella and a green carpet bag and all that good stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, there, I'll give you the book back. Um, and yeah, he was offered a partnership in Chicago during uh, the 1850s. Um, yeah, that's partly right, too. He, was, he said, I don't want to do it because I, I, it, would, it would lock me in a law office and I'd probably catch typhus or something like that. He really wanted to go out on, that's what he says, I don't want to get sick, you know. So he said, I think he said because he, he, liked, uh, he liked the circuit and he was afraid that a Chicago law firm would, um, would, would really kind of shut him in. He didn't care for that at all. Now, the other part about him never charging a large fee, that's not really true, guys. That's, that's part of the legend. I mean, he, he would, he, and he said in the notes for a law lecture, he said the matter of fees is important. If you are a lawyer, you need to charge commiserate with your services, and you should charge a fair amount, but you should charge something that represents your honest labor. And, and I think he believed that. And he did sue people who didn't pay him. To get that $5,000 retainer from Illinois Central, he had to sue the railroad to go get it. All right? He, and he once sued a client for a $6 fee that he was not paid. He, 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 there was a hard edge to Lincoln, guys. We tend to forget that. He would not put up with that. There was one of his, one of his uh, law friends said, that people would take him for a bumpkin when he came into the courtroom, but he said, P this is a direct quote, he said, people who mistook Lincoln for a bumpkin would, just, would very soon wake up with their backs in the ditch. <laughs> True. All righty, well, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, do you feel in your book very much that you defended his partner and um, I know his partner capitalized uh, after his death? Oh, did he ever? <laughs> Yeah. How much that, that that's a great question. Um, Billy Herndon. Billy Herndon wrote the first major real biography of Lincoln called uh, Herndon's Lincoln after the war. Billy did us a great service in that while all these people were still alive, like 1867, 68, he went and interviewed all of these neighbors that knew Lincoln. He even interviewed Lincoln's old stepmother. And we're like, thank you, Billy. You wrote this stuff down before these people died. On the other hand, Billy was not an honest researcher. For one thing, he hated Mary Lincoln. They hate each other's guts. With good reason, guys. When Lincoln and Billy and Mary went to a ball one time, Billy told Mary that she, quote, danced like a snake. He meant that as a compliment. She didn't take it that way. He hated her guts. It was very well returned. So after the war, he went around gathering all the gossip and dirt on the Lincoln marriage he could get. So when he went and asked neighbors about the Lincoln marriage, he didn't say, so, Tell me about the Lincoln marriage. He said more like, tell me about all the crap on the Lincoln marriage. Tell me all the bad stuff. And of course, people reacted, and, and, and all these crazy stories floating around about how Mary chased him down the street with a butcher knife and stuff like that. So you've got to be careful with Billy, you know, because he would make things up, you know. He, I mean, for, for example, he said that Lincoln never sued a lawyer to get his fee. Well, I got 12 cases off the database that tell exactly the opposite. So my, my thing on Billy is take it with a big grain of salt. Don't listen to anything he says about Mary because it's very biased. Um, if he's giving you direct anecdotes that don't seem to be self-serving, because they're very often he would say things like, I'm the one that made Lincoln a Republican, and by God, I made him anti-slavery, and I was there at the great moments. I just kind of throw that out, too, because Billy trying to sound important, okay? Um, but if you follow that out, generally speaking, if you throw those things out, he's pretty accurate from what we can verify on that. Well, Billy was a character, died an alcoholic. He was quite, quite the interesting sort. We're all grateful that he wrote this stuff down. Just kind of wish he would have been a little more objective when he did it, you know? <laughs> you know. All righty, well, I guess I'm, I'm sorry, one more. Yeah, yeah. One more question. Uh -huh. um, another question concerning the Colonel Thomas Alford and his exploration. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, what examples are there of what they were looking for and what happened? Yeah, that's a great question. Bar Barack Obama has. Um, Put Lincoln front and center, man. I mean, big time. You know, um, in that in that 160 minutes interview he did, he mentioned Lincoln um, and his cabinet with the Doris Kearns Goodwin book, Team of Rivals. Which I'm, have you guys read that? It's a it's an awesome read. I mean, I just I you know I, I just think I wish I'd written this. It's beautiful, you know. But um, I think you ought to be. I think I think Barack and the other presidents should be very careful about using Lincoln as a um, 
example because the contexts are so radically different. For example, there's this whole thing that's come up recently where um, you know, Lincoln supposedly appointed his rivals to his cabinets. Well, yeah, he did do that, but look, guys, presidents back then always did that. I mean, it's not like Lincoln just invented that. If you go look at other previous presidents, they were all putting their rivals in the cabinet. The better to keep an eye on them, you know? To keep your enemies close, and your, or your friends close, and your enemies closer, you know? And then that was, that was the attitude. So, yeah, presidents ought to be careful about being that specific. I would like to think that presidents emulate Lincoln's communication skills. Sometimes that's been the case, sometimes it hasn't. You know, um, I could see echoes of um, some of Lincoln's cadences and Obama's speeches and things like that. So I think that's a good thing. Yeah. All righty, well, thank you. I appreciate it. So. <laughs> oh.